introduce you to John Norris, who does not need an introduction. I feel like everyone knows John here. John is the managing director at Silicon Valley Bank, and he leads a strategic, strategic relationship with many healthcare venture firms and entrepreneurs. John speaks at major investor and industry conferences about healthcare venture trends, and he has over 20 years of experience in the space. And so I feel like 2022 has been a wild ride on the market. And I'm looking forward to hearing from John on what he thinks this year would be and what next year could look like for healthcare investment. And I sure hope that we have reached the bottom of the mark, uh, you know, all these things that's going on right now and things are looking up. That's my hope. Uh, John will be taking questions along the way. Um, so if you have any question uh, for John, if you can type it on the Q&A section and we'll answer the question uh, throughout the talk. With that, uh, the floor is yours, John. Thank you so much, Christine. It's always great to be here. I know we've had some great conversations uh, over the years. And you know, just as, a, as the quick overview of Silicon Valley Bank, just so you sort of get a sense of who we are, yeah, you know, we've been around for 30 plus years, and really we focus on working with companies that have some sort of secret sauce technology. We have a healthcare practice, we have a technology practice. We love to work with companies that just have an idea on the back of a napkin and need to establish a bank account up through venture funding, public, big growth, et cetera. We work with companies all along that life cycle. So if you ever have um, a need to talk uh, to us about banking, you know, feel free to just send me an email. I'll get you connected to the right place. And, and as Christine had, had said, you know, I, I really interact with the venture folks on a daily basis. And that's one part of my job. The second part is really understanding what's going on with the data. And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. We publish a report twice a year that really goes into depth around where, what are the dollars that are being fundraised by the healthcare investors? How are those dollars being deployed into companies? and in what sector, and then how does that sort of match with what you're seeing on the m and and the IPO side? So we're gonna go through all of that. I'm going to share my screen to talk about what's going on. Here's sort of the, the, the show flow. We're gonna talk about fundraising and investments. We're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into computational biology, AI, machine learning, how that applies into uh, tools as well as uh, biopharma. And then we'll look at m and and IPO activity. And so I was gonna, sort of pause between each sector. Um, and if you want to, if questions come to you as we're going through the slides, please just enter it into the Q&A and then Christine uh, will be happy to sort of read that after, at each pause uh, before we go from one sector to the other. And so with that, um, we'll start with the fundraising slide. And so this slide, just to give you a sense is, you know, we look at every single healthcare venture investment or venture fund uh, excuse me, every venture fund that closes in the U.S. And we say, do they invest in healthcare or not? And if they do invest in healthcare, what percentage of the fund do we think they're going to invest into healthcare? And so that's the number that you see here. So, you know, for firms like the Column Group and Arch, they 100% of their funds are focused on healthcare, but other firms like Alpha Wave and Tiger Global, um, NEA would be an example where they have part of their fund focused on healthcare we approximate the percentage that we think they're gonna be investing into the healthcare industry. And so again, you know, these are the numbers that you see on a fundraising side. This is the yearly amount of capital that's been fundraised to invest in companies. And if you think about like this yearly number, think about it from the sense of these are new funds. So over the next, let's say two to three years, they're gonna be invested into new companies to that firm. And then over the next seven to 10 years, those companies are gonna continue to be supported by those funds with their dry powder that they set aside. And so if you really look at um, these, these, uh, these pieces of data, you can see a nice jump from 2019 to 2020. And then in 2021, we had a record amount of fundraising really driven by the IPO and M&A activity we've seen across all sectors. And really when we went into 2022, my thought was that we were gonna see a reduction because most of the funds have been raised in 2020 and 2021. I didn't think they'd be coming out back to the market as quickly as they had been, but I was surprised. And so the first half of this year, we're at $15.8 billion, which basically puts us on set on track for another record fundraise. And that's great news for companies, right? Because this is dollars to be deployed into venture healthcare. And if you think about it over the last uh, 18 months, $44 billion has been fundraised 
for investment into sort of the healthcare venture arena. So we've never been more, um, you know, full of dollars to be allocated. That doesn't mean that we're seeing a continued frenzy of investing, which we'll get into in the next slide. So with this being the fundraising slide, let's go into the slide where we actually look at the dollars being deployed into companies. So this looks at investment into companies in the US and Europe on a quarterly basis. Um, I think for context, you could see 2020 at $52 billion um, was eclipsed by over 60% in 2021 at $86.8 billion. And that number was triple the numbers that we saw in 2018 and 2019. So for context, 2021 was the record to set all record years. And even when we went into 2022, the first quarter was very strong. The second quarter, not quite as strong, but if you put it into the context of what these dollars look like compared to previous years, yes, it's not, it's not um, keeping pace with what we saw in 2021, but Q2 was actually bigger than any quarter in 2020 other than Q3. So really strong investment. And so that's kind of the numbers that you saw at the, at the halfway point of this year. Strong investment numbers, not quite at the pace that we saw, which was record setting in 2021, but actually ahead of the pace of 2020. And we've gone into Q3 a little bit. That's kind of the new data that we have out there, looking at the first half of the quarter, so the first month and a half. And actually, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the decline in the number of deals as well as the number of dollars that have been invested in Q3. It's pretty low. And in fact, you know, it's extremely low on the DX tool side. But I think that's really based on, on a couple of things that we're seeing out in the market. And even though we have investors with all this capital to deploy, I think both investors are, are basically in some state of paralysis. And, it, and that paralysis takes two different forms. One is they have to look at their existing portfolio and understand how many of those companies need to fundraise? How do I help them fundraise? Do I need to think about cutting costs back or cutting people or thinking about refocusing on, on you know, the portfolio and the pipeline in various ways? And that takes a lot of their mind share. And because of that, they're not investing as aggressively as we've seen them in the past year. And second is really trying to understand to Christine's point, like what is going on with valuations? Have we hit a bottom? You know, most of the valuations that investors establish are predicated on what's going on in the public market or previous M&A activity. And so when the, the IPO market has been challenged and has dropped market share across the different healthcare sectors by a fairly significant margin, and you know, when, what's the bottom? And, and how do you think as an investor doing a deal that's later stage to establish a valuation that's going to give you the return down the road that's going to be beneficial to you. And that's the challenge. And because of that, I think what we're seeing now is a lot more insider rounds, which are the existing investors just looking to push cash out into 2023 as far as they can, or they're opening up previously done rounds for investors that either will cut back before as they've got in or weren't able to be added to the syndicate and seeing if those folks will add in capital. And so because of that, that ends up being smaller rounds and, and less dollar amounts overall. So that's one of the reasons why Q3 is reacting the way it is. And so with that, let's sort of look at the different sectors um, uh, by design. And we're going to go through biopharma, health tech, DX tools, and device. And I think I'm going to probably spend the least amount of time on biopharma. I'll go through it fairly quickly and more time on health tech, DX tools, and device. And so this first slide looks at series A in biopharma. And I think you know if there's any takeaway there is that Series A continues to be super strong and actually being led by this continuing effect of really large Series A deals. So we see continued large amounts of these $50 million Series A financings, which used to be done as a predicate to jump into a crossover round and then very quick IPO. But now really it's, it's, it's a way to leverage your and, and um, mitigate your financing risk. Because if we're raising a really large round, that gets you to the bigger milestones. And it also, you know, uh, it alleviates the, the need to go out and look for an outside investor in, in 15 to 20 months, and instead giving you, you know, significant amount of time to build value in your company before you finance again. Really being led by oncology, we saw a pullback the first half of this year in neurology and in the number of deals on the anti-infective side. 
yet valuations continue to be strong. And if you look overall within biopharma, you know, again, fairly strong, a give back from Q1 to Q2, although there was one $3 billion financing, Altos Labs in Q1, that kind of pushed that number uh, to 11.1 billion. But if you look at it overall, platform dollars are up and those are deals where you have you know, multiple assets that are preclinical. You're just not quite sure where you're gonna focus yet. Um, and oncology, neuro and orphan are pulled back a little bit, but Anna Infective on the late stage has seen actually more investment. But what we're really, the, the, the big issue is the crossover activity and investing into these late stage deals because the crossovers has seen this playbook that allows you to invest quickly and get to an IPO in a very short time frame, you know, that's worked out well for them. But now because the IPO market has retracted and it's harder to get out, the number of private companies that they have has really built up. You can see it through the percentage of the companies that have IPO uh, that, that are these crossover backed $40 million plus rounds. You can see there's more and more of those folks. And because there's so many that are still private, these folks are not investing in these large crossover rounds right now. They're waiting for the IPO market to go so that these private companies can go out so then they can invest more into the private companies and sort of restock their, their, their pipeline of private deals. But right now the pipeline is fairly, is fairly stocked and there's nowhere for them to go. So that's really leading to a pullback in the deals and what we're seeing in biopharma. And if we look at overall on the investment side, you know, while you see firms like Orbimed continue to be very strong in the set in the first half of 2022, all the late stage folks have seen significant pullback in the number of deals they did in 2021 versus the first half of 2022. And especially in these companies that are platform companies, because you're so far away from the clinic and because what we're seeing or what we feel anecdotally is that the public markets want clinical stage uh, deals, we're seeing those folks retract in that investment as well. So that's really the uh, uh, biopharma as a as a whole. And I'll pause here, Christine, if there are any questions here on biopharma before I jump to the next section. One of the questions that came out uh, let's see, is like, what do you see happening with the seed stage investors? So I think seed stage investors, especially in biopharma, continue to be strong and actually across all the healthcare sectors. And the reason is because in healthcare, investor syndicates continue to be very robust. And that just means there's a lot of investors that come in to help support companies, which is really good news for companies because that means there's a lot of dry powder around the table, but it's a problem for the venture funds themselves because what happens is all of a sudden their portfolio of companies start to look very similar to all the folks that they're investing alongside. And when you think about the LPs that are investing into these venture firms, they want a differentiated strategy as well as a differentiated portfolio. And so when these portfolios start to look the same, the way that these firms differentiate is on the company starting side and on the seed side. Because at seed stage, they get a bigger ownership and they help, and a lot of times they're actually helping to put these companies together. And that's a way of showing the LPs that they have the ability to create their own deal flow. So I don't think we're gonna see much of a, of a, of a decline in seed series A. Although I would say if I had to pick a sector where there's going to be probably the sharpest focus on continuing activity there, it would be device. I would be a little bit more worried about device than the other sectors, but I do feel like seed and seed seed rounds continue to be very strong even into 2022. Were there any other questions? That's good for now. Okay, cool. So let's jump into um, health tech. And when you look at Series A and health tech, a couple things to note that I think is interesting. One is despite what we've seen in terms of the public market, early stage valuations continue to be very strong. The pre-money valuation for the companies that actually had that as publicly available data from the pitch book data that we pull from, $13 million was a pre-money valuation on a $4 million deal size. So really heady uh, valuations here, really being led by alternative care and wellness and education. These are two areas where we've seen a lot of investment. Alternative care, sort of in your mind, think about alternatives to hospital. Is there a way of treating a patient outside of the hospital? And so you have a lot of, you know, uh, mental health, senior care, et cetera. And, and so you're seeing a lot of that activity, but you're also seeing actually a lot of women's health fields. And so that's been a growing area within health tech, not only on the reproductive side, but just you know, it, it's but it's it's looking more broadly within the 
within the broader patient population. And we expect that to, that to continue, as well as a lot of alternative care companies that are very focused in one, one specific area like mental health. We expect those folks to look to expand. And, and if they have the capital to do that, they'll do that. If they don't have the capital, we expect other bigger, either private companies or public companies to think about acquiring them. Uh, and then overall within health tech, again, really strong investment in this sector, um, less investment overall in alternative care, but obviously series A is still strong. Um, clinical trial enablement, which is a lot of drug discovery companies that are using sort of AI and more on the services side, we're seeing a lot of activity there. But if you're looking at the highest value financings in 2022, the vast majority are in alternative care companies. And you can see these amazingly high post-money valuations for like Roman, um, Dr. Lim, you know, 5.9 billion, 6.6 .6 billion. The lowest uh, valuation in the top 10 is 2.7 billion. And you just wonder like how, what is the exit opportunity for these companies? And, and, and are they so, you know, what, what kind of benefit do they get from this valuation? Obviously one is it, it, it's, you know, it's value creating for the investors and, and, you know, the underlying company, and we'll see what the exit looks like, but it also allows them to, you know, through these large fundraises to have a lot of capital available. And that's really what I was talking about before. It doesn't, it would not surprise me to see some of these big deals like Roe, and they've already done some venture-backed acquisitions to continue to look at the venture-backed market as a source of either adding or expanding their platform. And so it's very interesting. I think these are really, you know, besides your uh, original sort of public company acquirers that you would think in health tech, these are also acquirers out there. And it wouldn't surprise me to see these folks being very active. And onto who are the top investors, I think you're seeing general catalyst and insight actually pick up their pace in 2022. And on the late stage crossover activity, you're not actually seeing as much retractment as you saw in biopharma. Sure, you're seeing folks like maybe SoftBank is doing less deals in 22 than they did in 21, but the other big players still look like they're doing pretty active investment. And on the corporate side, you're seeing some other new folks like Optum and Burke really being very aggressive out there as investors. And so I think it's a really strong arena. What I worry about is what do you do with the companies that have raised at some pretty high valuations on the health tech side that have to think about another outside financing? And what does that look like when you have a public market where those companies that have IPO'd have certainly struggled? And how are they going to wreck that? How are they going to uh, you know, sort of grow into their valuation? And the idea may be inorganically, or maybe you know they have enough time because of the rounds that they raise that they'll be able to get to a point where you know they can grow into that valuation. Uh, Christine, anything here on health tech from the audience? Uh, yeah, one question is, what is the exit strategy for these companies? I mean, for those companies that you mentioned. You know, here. I think right now the the strategy is you know thinking about you know M and A. Uh, the IPO market is a really tough market. Um, you know, that I, so I think, you know, that's, that's one exit strategy. I think consolidation is another exit strategy, especially when you're sort of thinking about folks that are hyper-focused on building out, let's say one part of alternative care system and really owning that. And, and that is valuable, but what's other also valuable is leveraging how you did that into other platforms on the alternative care side as well. And so that's where you know, consolidation and expansion is really going to be one of the things that we're keeping our eye on, because it wouldn't surprise me to see you know, that happening. And typically, you know, that can happen in a accretive way, but I think it's really going to be a have versus have nots, where the folks who are have a lot of capital and have that valuation they have to grow into are going to look for the smaller companies that maybe might struggle to fundraise at a higher valuation and look to acquire those folks and leverage that technology into what they're doing. And those can still be good exits for those companies. It just may not be, you know, building this company into that huge series C and then growing it into a public company. It may just be, you know, a burden hand out of two or three X up front is the way to go for this company. And, and you're merging it into a, an opportunity where you can then, you know, go, go on from there. So, um, I think the exit opportunity is a little bit muted right now, but I, it, it's not going to, it, it doesn't surprise me 
to see like we'll, to see more M and A down the road, especially for folks that are you know dipping their toe into the water of healthcare. When you think about folks like Amazon, et cetera, and you think where the opportunities are, you know, the you know, big tech companies getting into healthcare. We've been saying that for a long time. I think we're starting to see some of that actually prove out right now. And hopefully, maybe you know, in a year or so, the public market is looking better again. That's might change too. Well, I don't know. Yeah. So one, yeah, one more question in wellness. Are they mainly hardware companies such as the Peloton or app platforms such as Amada Health? Um, it's more Amada Health. Um, I think that's really where 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 the opportunity is. Yeah, when we look, we we typically put like sort of a fitness tracker and not and things that are not uh, dealing with sort of non healthcare grade data. We sort of take we don't include them in our wellness category for the most part. So just so it is, it's more like yeah you know, the the Amadas of the world. Great. So let's just, we'll, we'll keep going and going into the, the DX tool sector. Just to give you a sense of how we're thinking about DX tools, we put that in three different categories. One are sort of the R&D tools, which are, you know, lab equipment, et cetera, that are being sold into, you know, biopharma as well, and, and tools companies as well as academia. You have DX tests, which are proprietary yes, no tests that give you an answer to a problem. And then DX analytics is a category that kind of overlaps into health tech a little bit, where it's actionable data that helps clinicians make a choice on their treatment options. And so those are the three categories that we look at. And if we do look at sort of, you know, what's happened in Series A, we did see a fairly big decline in Q2 on the Series A activity for uh, the DX tools arena. And, and if you think about sort of where, you know, where that is um, being, you know, uh, for, you know, where, where, it's, where it's resting. It's really, I think, a little bit less on, we've seen a little bit less activity on R&D tool side. But if I have to think about one area for sort of DX uh, tools investment, you're seeing a lot of focus on neurology. And if you think about on the DX test side where you have, you know, brain health and, and autism, you know, in DX analytics, you have migraine treatment, and neurostructure analysis, um, you know, these are these are really interesting areas where, you know, on the DX test side, there was such a focus on, um, you know, liquid biopsy, ontology, where you're not seeing as much Series A activity there. It's a little bit more focused on neuro, which I think is interesting. And if you look at overall within DX tools, pretty strong investment even on the later stage, really dominated by R and D tools. And so while DX test Series A activity was actually pretty good. You can see it, it's retracting if you have to look and sort of, you know, the idea is looking at first half deals and multiply by two to see what it would look like versus 2021. The X test activity is a little bit down, um, but R&D tools continue to be really strong. And you see there's a couple of really big billion dollar plus financings that still happened on the DX tool side in terms of where the post money valuation is, as well as a, as a number of of larger financings, maybe not to the extent that we saw in, in 2021, but still a pretty strong ability for these companies to, to get financing. But the question that I really have is, you know, over the last 18 months, there's, again, there's 12 companies that finance that had valuations post money over a billion dollars. And the question is, where do those folks land? You know, you've only seen a couple billion dollar upfront payments. You had Grail and Thrive, uh, both 2020 M&A deals. You saw some you know, big IPOs that have gotten to billion dollar plus valuations, but a, a number of those have given back their value. Where do these companies go? And I think really the question or the answer is because they're so well funded, they can just keep focusing on development and, and you know, getting into revenue because they do have the time and the capital to do that. And once they do that, they can wait for sort of being, getting through what's a tougher financing environment right now to see where things go from here. And if we look at investors, um, I think you're seeing some retractment, especially on the later stage side for some of the bigger players that got into DX tools in 2021, seeing less activity there. And even some of the major venture folks, less activity, but uh, more from firms like Capalia. And then on the corporate side, Bristol Myers and, and Google and Coke, uh, you're seeing these folks coming in and doing some of these later stage deals, which is really great to see. So while you're seeing some folks kind of retract out of the mountain, out of the 
out of the market, you're seeing other folks joining in. So actually, I think it's still a fairly active you know, investor market on the DX tools sector. Uh, Christine, any, any questions that come up in this sector before we move on to device? Yeah, so a couple questions. Do you have insights into enabling platforms for metabolomics, lipidomics, proteomics? And looking at companies like Sapiens, Sayer, Shear, Nautilus uh, as enablers for us. Yeah, and I think um, we'll, we'll get to where I'm actually seeing some really interesting investment on the computational uh, bio side. But I do think, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity for platform technologies. And I think, you know, the one caveat is, you know, how close are those to getting to a product? And how are investors thinking about the cash that these companies have, what their cash burn is, and how they're getting to valuation creation milestones? So I will say the caution for these platform technologies is similar to the platform technologies in biopharma, where you where you do want you may have to be focusing more of your capital on one opportunity versus you know deploying capital across multiple opportunities that you're developing in tandem because of the you know the the fact that it's a lot harder to finance out there. So mm -hmm. I do think there's a lot of interest out there, but I think that's one of the caveats that we're seeing investors you know, push these companies to make sure that, you know, they they can get to major valuation inflection points that creates value and enables them to have an outside financing for that. That's what these investors are critically focused on over the next year, I think. Mm -hmm. One more question. Do you have any idea what percentage of these early stage DX companies have used RCT to validate their tools? Um, that is a good science question that I don't have an answer to. And so okay. unfortunately, I'll, I'll, I'll defer an answer on that one. But yeah, so I'm, I'm smart, smart enough about the data, but I'm also smart enough not to answer a question I don't know the answer to. So um, on this one, I'll have to, I'll, I, I, can't, I can't help on that. All right, so with that, let's, let's sort of head into device, which is the, the last sector we'll go over. And then I'm going to quickly just go through exits to give you a sense of where things are after I go through computational bio. But we have, you know, probably be about, you know, 10 more minutes or so. Then I want to leave plenty of time for additional questions. So if we think about medical device on the seed series A side, you continue to see really strong activity here, even though that was the one area where I said I worry a little bit on seed for device. But what I worry about is what's happening in Q3. And actually, in the first month and a half, there were only four deals for $34 million. And obviously, you know, we're looking at pitch book data and sometimes they get backdated and some of that activity may happen. But I am concerned about early stage device because you do have, you know, um, and you've been seeing a retractment both on the IPO side and you've seen less M&A activity, but we'll see where things are gonna go uh, on this. But I just do worry. But if you do look at where activity is in series A, it's non-invasive monitoring, which is really sensor-based technology which is similar to how you think about health tech and alternative care, where you've figured out ways to treat and monitor a patient outside the hospital setting. So important. If there's any silver lining to you know, the, the horrible pandemic that, that we've had to, to deal with over the past few years, it's that one, you, know, you can get treatment outside the hospital. You can engage with folks where you don't have to be face-to-face -face in person to get care. And then two, you know, the ability to monitor these patients outside the hospital to make sure that, you know, they can quickly figure out issues that these patients are having and treat them quickly is so important. So we've definitely seen a lot more activity on the non-invasive monitoring side. What's interesting to me is, especially on the cardiovascular side, where these are deals where typically you have to have pretty extensive human clinical trials, uh, PMA pathway type stuff, you're seeing less early stage investment there. And I know that there are a lot of later stage sort of venture back cardiovascular companies out there, but early stage, we're seeing not as much activity there. And I think there's a little investor reticence uh, to, to be deploying capital in a, in a deal that's gonna be capital intensive and take a little bit of time, especially at this, in this uh, market. But if we look overall within device, again, really strong in the first half of this year. And even in Q3, you're seeing really strong deals but the number of deals actually is a lot lower. And if you, if you look at it, so what's happening is you're seeing some really big financings close, but overall late stage investing has been really difficult for companies. And so if you look at the top deals in Q3, just in the first month and a half, 
You had Bioformis, which raised 320 million at a $1 billion pre. Orchestra raised $110 million. Uh, Medical Microinstruments, 75 on a, on a robotics deal. And Kerasis is a wound healing company, raised 60. So some big financings out there. Yet overall deal activity is down. And it's down because you know it's, it's really hard to establish valuation in device right now. Because when you look at what the exit value is in M&A, which typically the median M&A upfront for device is somewhere in the two to $250 million range. There's so many companies that have raised over the last three years that all have valuations in the in post money of 150 to $350 million. And how do you rectify that in a time where you can't go public right now and you need to raise additional financing? So there's a lot of, of focus on what's gonna happen to these later stage deals. On the investor side, there's a lot of red on this graph. You are seeing the late stage crossover folks pull back. There are different crossovers that are coming into the sector. And if you are a medical device company, you're interested in seeing some of the activity that we are seeing in 2022. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Corporate, you're seeing a lot, again, less activity from the corporates on, on the, from the folks who had been investing in 2021, but you're seeing different corporates come in that are still doing deals but you are seeing a lot of folks that had 2021 activity really pull back in the market. But as I said, it's being filled in by other folks that are coming into the market. And if you are interested in seeing what type of companies those are, you feel free to reach out to me directly because I have some slides on that. Um, so before I get into the computational bio, Christine, was there any, any uh, commentary or questions for the device side? Yeah, there's one question. How different are valuation in non-invasive monitoring devices wearable versus PMA kind of product? Um, if, if I had to just do a back of a napkin, I would say, you know, on the early stage side, it's maybe two to three X difference. And, and the reason be, is because there's a lot longer road on the cardiovascular side and in the non-invasive monitoring side, you're seeing it's a little bit more of a, uh, a wider group of investor set that's interested in that area because you're overlapping into the technology side. And so you have the tech investors that are interested in healthcare coming in to do those deals. They wouldn't touch a cardiovascular like device company because they don't understand that sector. But if it's talking about algorithms and you know, uh, you know leveraging AI machine learning and you know, data uh, in the cloud and, you know, they get that. And so it's applying what they know into the healthcare sector. So you see a lot more investors. And because of that, on the early stage side, valuations have really expanded. And then you have, you know, firms like, you have deals like Preventus and Barty and, um, and there's the one that Best Buy bought as well. So you have three recent good exits out there. So that's really spurred the valuations to go up on the non-invasive monitoring uh, uh, side. Whereas on the cardiovascular side, again, you have typically some clinical trials, extended clinical trials. And as you've seen over time, you know you don't get to exit unless you have some good clinical trial data. You might not have to get FDA approval, but you have to have clinical trial data. And that takes some time and it takes a lot of money. So I think because of that, there's a, a thought process of not trying to set the valuation too high early um, because the idea is you want to grow into that valuation over time as you build value. So that's kind of my very, very quick and, and dirty focus if you had to say non-invasive monitoring versus cardiovascular. Okay. One more question. What are your thoughts on continuous glucose monitoring devices becoming a commodity levels very assume the value in the data? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we are still seeing, you know, those companies um continuing to generate some pretty high valuations. So there's a lot of excitement out there. And the question is, how do you do it in a way that is differentiated and better? Because if you if you sort of think about the, the things that are out there, there are some technolo technologically advanced um, opportunities out there, but yeah, you still continue to see people having issues with them for one way or the other. So can you build a better mousetrap? And if you, so, if you can, it has ease of use and it, it does what you want it to do, then you know there will be a market for it. So I still are, am, am excited about that area, but I do know that there are a lot of players out there, there are established players, and there's some folks that are late stage with some pretty high valuations. Uh, the competitive landscape is pretty, is pretty, uh, is pretty harsh out there. 
but I do think there's opportunity for innovation. Okay. Well, and so, great. yeah, with that, let's let's look a little bit at co computational biology, and then we'll move to the exits, which we'll do really fast, and then save time for uh, questions at the end. So, you know, computational biology, uh, there's a lot of different definitions to what you want to say as a computational biology company, but this is kind of how we're thinking about it. We're looking at R&D tools companies, as well as biotech companies that have some sort of novel computational tool that gains biological or chemical insights with the ability to create that into a platform technology. But most important is that you have a team with computational experience. And so we've seen a lot of folks that use the terms AI, machine learning, you know, uh, in their, in their um, you know, website. But if you don't have actually a computational bio team as part of your core team, then we're not calling it a computational bio company. So that's kind of how we're thinking about this sector and looking at it versus the non-computational bio. Because in a sense, you know, you can make an argument that any company is leveraging some sort of AI or machine learning and, and doing its job. But again, this is sort of more novel. And what we've seen over time is in, in sort of the light gray is a computational bio investment. The dark gray is non-computational. You can see this dollars grow in 2021 with a billion dollars uh, raised by computational bio companies just in Q4 for seed and series A deals. And you've continued to see that really good activity on the computational bio side in the first half of this year. What I think is interesting is the valuation for these companies have really started to skyrocket with the $18 million pre-money valuation on a $23 million deal. And one of the reasons why we're seeing that is we're finally seeing a little bit more competition on the early stage computational bio side by investors, where over the previous couple of years, you were really seeing mostly tech focused uh, venture firms that have some healthcare experience leveraged in. Those were the folks that were taking these computational bio bets. Um, and I think what's what we're seeing now is the traditional healthcare folks have finally realized that this is a spot they need to spend some time in, even though it's early stage, even though a lot of these companies don't have an asset they, they've already defined, you're seeing firms like Orbimed and RA Capital and SV, Samsara, Omega, Vita coming in to do these deals on the seed series A side. They were not seed series A investors in comp bio deals in the previous few years. So because of that, you're starting to see, you know, a, you know really interesting syndicates form where you have the tech focused folks who have some really good perspective and, and help for these companies on sort of, you know, developing that black box around their algorithm. And then you have the healthcare perspective on how to monetize and grow that company from the healthcare side. So I think we're in a really good space right now. And because of that, the step ups that we're seeing uh, for these companies is pretty, is pretty uh, spectacular. And the step ups that, and what I mean by that is I looked at what was the post money value of the round that they raised between 2019 and 2021? And then what is that step up to the pre-money value that they did in the 2022 financing? And you're seeing what's interesting to me is kind of a divergence between the value, post money value of a company versus the step ups that we're seeing. So the R&D tools companies, the ones that are really not necessarily uh, choosing an asset to actually bring into the clinic, but it's a more services oriented focus um, with their algorithms. Those are the R&D tools companies. And those are the ones that are actually generating the biggest step up in multiples in 2022. But if you're looking at overall value to the company in terms of a post money value, those are dominated by more of the biopharma companies that are leveraging computational bio in terms of developing and, and pushing forward their own assets in the clinic. So I think that's pretty interesting. If you look at comp bio, maybe in uh, multiples versus non-comp bio, you can see there's a huge difference, especially in early stage um, seed to A step ups, but even, even later stage as well, the computational bio companies seem to be generating a lot more excitement and interest around where they're going. And I think it's really because we're starting to see some of those companies that went public and some of the companies that are getting acquired uh, by big biopharma, as you're starting to see these exits actually occur. And you're starting to see that, you know, there's an engagement by big biopharma in the form of 
you know, uh, partnerships, et cetera, that have now transformed into M&A. And so because of all that, I think it's a really interesting area that's getting a lot of, a lot of attention right now. Uh, Christine, any questions on this side before I go into the exits? Uh, no, there's no question on this side. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to spend the next like three or four minutes on the exits. I'm going to go through pretty fast. And then, and then we'll make sure we have a little bit of time for our questions if anybody has them at the end. Um, and, and Christine, I'll make sure and send you a PDF of this uh, slide deck so that you have for folks who want to take a look at it more in depth. And so on, on the uh, exit side, M&A and IPO, obviously, you know, the story that you're going to see repeated along all these se uh, uh, sectors is that IPOs have fallen down significantly from what we saw in 2021 but we're also seeing some retracting in M&A as well. And the reason on the IPO side for Biopharma is that previous IPOs, while they used to have spectacular performance in the short term, those companies are coming back to reality and really gotten hit by the valuation you know, degradement that we're seeing across you know, every public company that's out there. And so because of that, we're seeing it's a lot more difficult to raise money in the public market. And even on the M&A side, we're seeing less deals out there but you know, if, if, what we're really seeing is that if, if folks are looking to buy companies, they're looking to buy companies that have already recently gone public over the last couple of years, because at least on those companies, the valuation is being traded on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You have a public company, it's got a market cap on a day-to-day -day basis, where the challenge is for all the companies that financed the 2019 to 2021, they have this post-money value that doesn't change unless you do another financing. And so it's really difficult based on where values are now in the public market to pay top dollar for these companies um, based on where the valuation is right now. And so investors, they, they, want, a, they want a good return on their money. So it's gonna, it, they really need to have the type of, of multiples that they need in order to effectuate a, uh, you know, a deal, but they're not getting that because valuations are so down in the public market. So it's a little bit of an issue. So even though you saw some big deals there were only two deals, but both of those deals, if you look at the post money of the last private round, the late stage investors are not getting much in terms of good multiples on those deals. Um, and if you go into health tech, you, know, you look at zero IPOs for venture-backed health tech companies in the first half of this year from 16 uh, for the full year last year. And you know, while you do see a bunch of M&A in health tech, where we track every M&A because most of those deals are undisclosed. So we're just trying to just look at quantity versus quality, like IPOs for biopharma and device and, and uh, the X tools, we look at at least a minimum upfront payment. For health tech, we don't. But if you do look at the deals that have you know, over 50 million, there were only five publicly disclosed private M&A over 50 million in the first half of 2022. And if you look at that, two of the five, actually the exit value was lower than the last post money value per pitch book. And so you are seeing the consolidation that we're talking about out in the market, but you're also seeing, you know, some of these, um, you know, private companies looking to acquire these companies either through aqua hire, especially if you're talking about having people, skilled nursing or other folks that you can add into your company where it's really hard to find really that, that, that type of folk, um, and, as well as just looking to expand your platform. And then into the DX tool side, again, the story is, Lots of M&A and IPO in 2021, really retract back in 2022. Pretty poor performance on the IPO side. <clears throat> and if we look at M&A, you know, actually there's a lot more activity on the DX test side than we've seen. And actually there's another, there's a health tech company, Roe, acquiring, you know, a, a DX test company. Um, but yeah, you know, when you do see these deals, while they are upfront values and total deal values are smaller than we've seen in previous years, the multiple is actually pretty good. So you're seeing these companies that don't raise a lot of money that are getting snapped up early. So not only are you getting the, the time to exit being much reduced to just about three years, the medium time to exit for these deals, but the, the upfront multiple of these, the median upfront multiple is 13X. So you're seeing these companies getting acquired for really good multiples. So investors are getting really quick and good returns from these companies. Um, that doesn't, that it sort of doesn't help the companies that, that have financed and raised really big rounds at billion dollar plus valuations, but at least you're seeing some good early stage activity. And then finally in device, 
you know, again, no IPOs. M&A has actually gone down pretty significantly. You can see while the class of 2019 IPOs are actually still performing well, the other two years, 2020 and 2021, are actually pretty, pretty poor. And while you saw a lot of activity in 2021 on the M&A side, a lot of these small to mid-cap device companies realizing they need to buy new technology, we saw a lot of that activity in 2021, but now because everybody's market cap has taken huge hits, the small to mid-cap folks are a lot more thrifty about making sure they have cash on the balance sheet as well as you know, dealing with their own you know, uh, their, their own um, existing portfolio of, of uh, products versus thinking about adding something new right now. And so where do things go from here? You know, I think we're gonna see less fundraising in the second half of the year, definitely less investment um, because most of the investment we're gonna see are folks trying to do these inside rounds and, and trying to get cash through the end of 2023. And as I said, those rounds tend to be smaller than outside led rounds. You don't really want to, to go and have an outside led round right now, unless you've shown significant progress where it's just, you know, the, the milestone value creation events that you've created are just unassailable. And so that's the top 10% of companies out there can go out and those folks will get, you know, good step ups with a lot of investor interest. But if you don't have that story, it's very difficult to fundraise and, and find a new investor in this market. So it's a tough market out there, but we remain you know, excited about just the sheer amount of capital that's out there. The venture funds are not gonna give those money back to the LP. They will deploy it. They're just waiting right now to, to wait for that valuation to sort of bottom out. And then they're gonna jump back in and they're gonna invest with, with you know, a uh, excitement about getting things that are at slightly lower valuations than what we've seen over the previous two years. So I remain cautiously optimistic, but I think 2022 is going to be a tough second half of the year and into the first part of 2023, as a lot of companies have to figure out what their what their financing plan is going to be. So with that, maybe I'll stop sharing. We'll go back to to Christine and see if anybody had any any final questions. It's always so exciting to be able to present, yeah, you know, what we're seeing out in the market. Hopefully, it gives you a sense. Of uh, you know the the time that we are in right now, which is a little bit of a tough time, but I do think you know there's there's so much opportunity out there. We've never had so much capital out there to invest into these companies, and it will happen. It just it's 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 just tough right now, and so everyone has to understand and appreciate the cyclicality of this healthcare market, and know that while it's down, it will go back up. Mm -hmm. So one question. It's more like a comment, actually. Uh, Good Therapeutics was acquired preclinically for 250 million upfront. Company only raised 30 million, so it worked out very well. That was common. yep. Again, you know that's so. When you do see what's interesting on M and A, and that you see it in the DX tool side, if you can use a small amount of money at a good valuation, um, then there's opportunities to do deals that are at medians where we've seen historic historic deals that still provide good valuation or good multiple to investors. If that company had raised another $80 million at a 350 post, that deal, it would be very hard to make that happen. And so it's all about, you know, being smart about how you're fundraising. And especially, you know, it's hard because you want to leverage, you know, the time that you're in, right? In 2021, it probably made sense, especially early in 2021, to raise that bigger round because you saw this playbook happening. And then what happens, sometimes the playbook gets changed. And then you, you get put into a situation where you have to, you have to scramble a little bit. But, you know, I think, you know, Christine, you've seen this over time. You know, some of the best companies that, that you see on the exit side have had times where they've struggled. And either they struggled with their own product development or they struggled with a tough financing environment. And it's just, you know, that's that's par for the course. And investors have 10-year investment cycles. So they know that it's not going to be 10 years of up, up cycle. So I think that's the other thing to keep in mind too, is that investors realize this as well. And so, you know, they're trying to optimize their companies right now, which makes it a lot harder for them to, to get into new companies. So it's, it's yeah, so it's, it's, it's a tougher time, but I think, yeah, we'll, we'll come out of it. Yeah. So uh, next question, what are the trends in the digital health that you see? So I think alternative care continues to be uh, a super interesting area, but I do think 
that the question is going to be if you're if you're just in a one particular area, let's say senior care or mental health or women's health, how does that apply broader? How can you create a big company? And and is it enough to dominate that one sector to equal an exit? And and that's what we're going to see. I don't know what the right answer is. I think in certain situations it will be. Um, it'll be a nice add-on for a big company to add that in. But if you really want to be a big company, the idea is like, how do you leverage what you've learned and been successful in one part of that into more of a platform technology in different areas? And so I think that's one of the, the most intriguing areas, I think, in, in health tech right now, uh, especially with, with the ability to engage you know, outside the hospital and outside of face-to-face of -face in-person meetings, right? And so I think, you know, it, it, we've been trying to get people to do this for so long. Um, mm -hmm. engage that way. And there's always been a reticence to do it. And the pandemic forced us to, to try it. And I think people realized, you know, that's pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. And so the question is, you know, do, do the folks that are just, um, you know, you have the, the folks that are online only, you have the folks that are brick and mortar, you have the folks that are hybrid that have a little bit of each, you know, what's the right model? I think it's still to be determined. I think it's going to be very interesting to see where that, where that comes out. But I do think, you know, that as well as helping uh, providers to digitize their practice, I think those are two areas that are super, super interesting. Yeah, with, with a lot of this uh, labor shortage as well, I think that's a huge challenge that facing at least in the U.S. Uh, Agree. Um, you mentioned about, you know, it's a tough time ahead and uh, the market is not looking so great right now. What would be a good leading lead leading indicator for entrepreneur to see like, well, you know, things are moving up, you know, the right direction. And what can they do now, especially when they need the funding? Because, you know, people sometimes hard to time when yeah. uh, the market crashes. Yeah, it's hard. I will say that, you know, it, it seems to me, yeah, you know, one leading indicators are, you know, starting to see some IPOs and like you saw in biotech, uh, you saw an IPO that went out where the IPO value was actually lower than the last round, but maybe that's okay. Yeah, the company was able to finance, they raised a large amount of money and now they're well capitalized. And so if you start to see some of those things, I think those are positive for the public market. I do think the other thing that we've seen is the emergence of you know, these angel investor groups yeah, we've always seen them around on the periphery, but I feel like I'm seeing even more and more activity from those folks because they are stepping in to those those companies that do need, you know, the the hundreds of thousands of dollars up to a couple million, where they can. You see multiple angel investor groups coming together to get to that number, and I think you want to leverage also the understanding of what the seed stage strategy is of these traditional investors. Because again, they have to differentiate themselves. So getting in to tell your story, even if it's too early, you're telling your story and you're promising uh, of what you're going to do. And then when you do it, you come back. I mean, that's the way to engage with these folks. So I'd say, you know, angel groups, I would say folks that have a, a seed stage strategy, which are a lot of uh, some of the bigger firms as well, is try and engage and leverage your network, leverage your banker like me, leverage your attorney, leverage your board of advisors, your scientific advisory board. These are the folks that can get you into having those, those opportunities to tell your story. And even if it is a tough time to finance right now, know that people are, are they still wanna meet, they wanna take their notes and they wanna see you, you know, a lot of times they wanna see you execute, right? You have to execute, especially if you don't, if you don't have a, a, you know, a prior successful exit in your back pocket that you can leverage. If you execute on your business plan, that's what people want to see. And so a lot of times, you know, you'll see, oh, you're too early, you know, come back when you do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, then you know what you need to do. And so I would say, you no, know, those are the kind of advice, advice for early stage investors. It's a tough time right now because, you know, investors' minds are really focused on their existing portfolio. Um, so it is, it's difficult. But just, you know, find ways to engage, find ways to stay networked. And even if you can't get in to talk to those investors right now, start networking with people who have those relationships so that you can leverage those folks into making, you know, productive introductions. So I think that's really, it's, it's so important. You have the cold introduction 
where you're just sending an email to an investor, it's so hard. You know, you have to hit the person on the right day with the right message and the right frame of mind, and they have to have the right, you know, idea of how they're deploying their capital right then. It's really hard. But when you have people that know these folks and you're leveraging those relationships, you 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 tend to be able to 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 make those connections a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. But I know we're out of time. Thanks so much for everybody's time. And thank you. Special thanks to John Norris for sharing with us all his insight. My it's pleasure. Thanks so much, back. Christine. Thank you. Have you back again. Anytime. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks.